Hi, 7th grade. This video will focus on the vocabulary that you have been working with this last couple of weeks. Uh, you are going to be having an assessment on the vocabulary and also CEE writing on Thursday or Friday or both days. So on this video, I will go over um, all these terms. I also have other videos embedded on here. So this video will be quite long and I don't expect you to finish it in a day. It might take you a couple of days to work on it. Uh, the first thing I want to go over is uh, the assignments that I assigned you on on Friday. Um, it is today. It's I'm making this video on Sunday. It's four or nine p.m. and it's looking kind of grim, right? Uh, if I look at Renaissance humanism for UCLA, uh, the following students have not done it. Right. Some of you guys started it already. And I said that I won't reset any videos under 67 because there's only four questions. Or there's, I think there's less than four questions. There's only a couple questions. So um, a 67 will be just fine. But if you see your name here, that means you have not started the video. And I'm guessing that it's probably going to be the same kids here. Um, Okay, so just be aware that uh, I will be keeping you guys at recess on Monday. And then also this one, it's quite a bit of you. Uh, you still have time today on Sunday to finish it. I will start texting home um, as soon as I'm done with this, with this video. Um, so again, if you see your name here, that means that you're, you're not done with your work and I need you to finish it. Uh, the Renaissance, a couple of you guys... They're not done with it. And then we have Renaissance Humanism. This one seems like uh, it's the big one. Uh, so today I'll keep, uh, so on Monday, I will be keeping you most likely at uh, recess one and also recess two. Um, I will also be texting your parents, just so you know, because I know some of you guys don't care about missing your recess, but I do. This one has a lot. And then we have, I think it was this one, Renaissance Humanism. So make sure you get it done. Um, so the way I want you to do this is you should all have a notebook uh, where you have the, um, where you have something that looks like this and in the middle you have the word and then you have a definition, you have characteristics, examples, and non-examples, okay? So for some of these, you can't do non-examples. For example, what's a non-example of um, Marco Polo? You can't. So you will leave that blank, okay? Um, let's start with classical antiquity. So for those of you guys who remember, so here I'm going to write classical antiquity is the same thing as the classical period okay uh, classical antiquity is simply uh, for definition you can say the civilizations of Greece Greece and Rome okay for characteristics for characteristics you can talk about their uh, achievements in architecture, achievements in mathematics, their achievements in philosophy, um, characteristics. You can also even say, you can also even say 500 BCE to 500 CE. Okay, it's also known as a classical period. For your drawing, you could do uh, a couple of drawings. You can do statues, uh, a nude statue. Uh, you can do the Pantheon for Rome, the Parthenon for Greece, and we'll get to those in a second. Okay, for non-examples, for non-examples, you can say it's the Middle Ages because they're two different periods. Okay, you can also say that a non-example can be the Renaissance if you're looking only at time period. Okay, so that's for the classical antiquity. Um, 
the big, big thing you need to know about classical antiquity is you need to know when it happened and what are some of the major characteristics of it. Uh, when it happened is going to be really important because you need to be able to organize the classical period, the medieval period, and the Renaissance in order. Okay? Um, and you also need to understand like the influence that the classical period has on the Renaissance. The idea uh, that humans are important. The idea that uh, people are logical. Okay? Uh, I have this video that I want to show you. And then... Uh, I'm going to be stopping this video once in a while, and then we'll continue. Classical antiquity is the period of cultural history between the 8th century BC and the 6th century AD centered on the Mediterranean Sea, comprising the inter... So here they said 8 BCE to 6 CE. Um, just keep it simple, just say 500 to 500. Uh, here you see a building of the Parthenon. This is a Greek building. A lot of you guys are having a hard time with this building and the Pantheon. They're two very different buildings. This one came first, and this one influences the Pantheon. Talking civilizations of an ancient Rome, the 6th century AD centered on the Mediterranean Sea, comprising the interlocking civilizations of ancient Greece and ancient Rome known as the Greco-Roman world. So Greco-Roman is also the same thing as the classical civilizations, classical antiquity. Uh, they did say interlocking because they did exist. Uh, they did overlap in existence. Now, this painting, you'll, you'll know what this painting is later. Um, this is called The Birth of Venus. This is a Renaissance painting. And you'll see that the Renaissance, they, they, a lot of the things that they do is to honor the classical period. Venus, I believe, was a goddess of Rome. Right. This uh, it's, it's going back to the classical period. Again, this is called the birth of Venus. This is a Renaissance um, painting and it, it focuses on the uh, Roman goddess. Even though people in the Renaissance were Christian or Catholic, it's not like they're celebrating this goddess. They're just like honoring the past. It is the period in which Greek and Roman society flourished and wielded great influence throughout much of Europe, North Africa and Western Asia. Conventionally, it is taken to begin with the earliest recorded epic Greek poetry of Homer and continues through the emergence of Christianity and the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So the classical period covers uh, covers more than a thousand years, so there's a lot here. Homer, uh, the writer of the Iliad, uh, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, and then in, in the Roman world you have Julius Caesar, you have Augustus, you have the the birth of Christianity, you have the acceptance of Christianity in, in Rome. It ends with the dissolution of classical culture at the close of late antiquity, blending into the early Middle Ages. Such a wide sampling of history and territory covers many disparate cultures and periods. Classical antiquity may also refer to an idealized vision among later people of what was, in Edgar Allan Poe's words, the glory that was Greece and the grandeur that was Rome. The culture of the ancient Greeks, together with some influences from the ancient Near East, was the basis of art, philosophy, society, and education until the Roman imperial period. Thank you for watching. So, uh, you'll like see, and subscribe if you'll see that the classical the classical period is the the backbone, the influence on Renaissance um, ideas. Okay, let's move on to the next word. This is gonna take a while. Now, ne next we have the Byzantine Empire. Now, if you remember. Um, in the 200s, we had the Roman Empire, and we had uh, two, two different halves. We had the Western Roman Empire and the, and the Eastern Roman Empire. The capital of the Western was, called the, was the city of Rome, and uh, the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire was Constantinople. Now, the Western Roman Empire falls in 476 CE, okay? 476 CE. The Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire, has another name, survived until 1453. Now, from one of the groups in class, you, if you remember, if you read this, um, the Byzantine Empire was able to keep knowledge of the classical period alive for a thousand years, right? Ro Western Roman Empire falls, the Eastern Roman Empire continues on, and and protects this knowledge. 
1453, uh, the Ottoman Turks, a group of Muslims, attacked Constantinople. And those people that were the guardians of the galaxy, no, the guardians of classical knowledge, they fled. They fled to Italy, right? They went to Italy, bringing with them classical knowledge. This is the seed of the Renaissance. Remember, the Renaissance is the rebirth of classicism, classical um, civilizations. And in order to be born, you need the knowledge. And this is where that comes into play. That is the reason why the Byzantine Empire is important. Besides this, right? There's many other reasons. But when the Byzantine Empire falls, these scholars leave, bringing with them this, um, this knowledge. Okay. Um, the next word is going to be humanism. And humanism is, if you see the word humanism, it has the word human in there. Now, humanism is a philosophy or an idea that people, it puts people at the center, right? That people are important, that life should be celebrated here on earth, that people are logical, right? That people can come up with solutions, that people are beautiful, that people are smart, right? And it's a very it's a very drastic change from what was happening in the medieval period where everything or mostly everything was about religion, right? In the medieval period, you explain things through religion. If there's an earthquake, well, maybe God did it, right? It's very religious based. In the Renaissance, you have this rebirth of humanism that comes from the classical period where you are uh, using logic to try to explain nature, right? when you are celebrating human nature, where you are focusing on the individual and not just religion, okay? Uh, let's watch this one together. That was a commercial, guys. What if you could do SEO smarter and faster? With Wix, you can edit your meta tags page by page or all in one go. Modify your URLs, Toward the end of the Middle Ages, Europe experienced a general revival of the interest in human beings, art, and literature. This revival was afterwards referred to as the Renaissance. The word Renaissance is French for rebirth. It was called this for two important reasons. First, the Black Plague, which swept through Europe and killed one-third of the human population, was coming to an end. People had more optimism that they were going to live now that the Black Plague was subsiding. Second, the movement was a revival in academic matters and appreciation for the power and beauty of the human being. That's really important. It felt like an escape from the Dark Ages. The spirit of optimism and free inquiry swept through Europe and caused a revival, especially in arts and literature. It may be helpful to draw a few contrasts between the Dark Ages and the Renaissance. In the Dark Ages, in Europe, ideas about art and education were controlled by the Roman Catholic Church. So again, church controls a lot of knowledge in the medieval period. Artists and educators use religious methods to meet religious goals. In the Renaissance, the focus became people and creation rather than heaven and angels. The methods artists and educators used in the Renaissance were driven by the skill of human observation and science. Research and discovery in the Renaissance era were for the sake of discovery, wherever it would lead. In the Dark Ages, it seemed that research was intended to support the status quo, whether in politics or the church. Therefore, Renaissance thinkers and artists were regarded as rebels to a degree. As Renaissance... Because they're now trying to challenge these ideas, right? They don't go with what the church is teaching. Instead, they, they do their own thing, like Galileo. Galileo was the astronomer who found uh, evidence that disagreed with the church. The church was teaching that everything was around, the earth was the center of everything. And he, he found that, well, no, I, he found examples of things not going around the earth. So he's like, wait, how does that make sense? Diaz traveled northward across the Alps into Germany and Switzerland. The movement came to be known as humanism because of its emphasis on the human mind and body. Portraits of saints in the dark ages were darker in color and somber in mood people were portrayed as suffering or waiting on God to deliver them. 
The human mind was tortured by spiritually dark forces and the heaviness of sin. In humanism, people's minds and bodies got to be celebrated. To the humanist, the human mind was capable of understanding truths on its own inquiry. People did not need to be spoon-fed the truth of the church. They could research and come to their own conclusions. The human mind was valuable, and the human body was valued as well. Renaissance art revived realism that celebrated the nuances of the human body. Veins, muscles, shadows, eyes, and other parts of the body were carefully researched and represented in art. This is going to be really important in the next couple of weeks when we look at examples of arts and sculpture. During the medieval period, arts and sculpture are made for the purpose of religion for the most part. In the, Medi in the Renaissance, it's made for realism. So you'll see that art and sculpture is very much more realistic in the Renaissance than it is in the medieval period. Because in the medieval period, it wasn't about realism. It was about the message of religion. In the Renaissance, it's about realism and celebrating human achievements, uh, while still staying true to religion as well. Leonardo da Vinci, for example, used to cut open cadavers to research how best to represent the human body in his art. The human body and the human mind became beautiful again, not tortured, but celebrated. In the Dark Ages, portrayals were especially made of famous people, but in the Renaissance era, common people with their common lives were also portrayed in art. This emphasis on art among the common people was a welcome change. The ancient Greeks were not afraid to celebrate the beauty of human anatomy. This trend revived itself in the art of the Renaissance. The Renaissance itself can be traced back to... That's going to be a word for you. Uh, anatomy is the study of the human body. Florence, Italy, during the height of the power of the... The ancient Greeks were... Renaissance. The Renaissance itself can be traced back to Florence, Italy, during the height of the power of the Medici family. The plague hit the town of Florence hard. In 1348, about 40% of the town's population succumbed to the plague. As the town was rebuilding, the Medici family patronized the arts and commissioned beautiful paintings and sculptures to adorn houses and the public square. Some of these sculptures included nude portrayals of people. Conservative townspeople objected. A famous preacher by the name of Girolamo Savonarola preached energetically against this new direction in art. He successfully had the Medici family expelled from the city, but soon after, they returned, and Savonarola was burned at the stake. Although the church did not embrace the new art at first, one of the Medici family ascended to the papacy and took the name Leo X. He did patronize the arts and sought to bring the same type of Renaissance paintings to Rome to adorn his new St. Peter's Cathedral. So at first the church was against it, but eventually they accept this new style, right? Um, and they become some of the biggest patrons. Again, a patron is a person that pays someone to do something for them. So the church actually becomes a huge patron. If you think of Michelangelo, Michelangelo's patrons were mostly the church. Right? A lot of his works are very religious. Da Vinci's most famous painting, The Last Supper, is also a religious piece. But it does have humanist tendencies. Okay. Michelangelo's Sistine Chapel, which he painted in 1508 to 1512, is an example of the religious application of Renaissance art in Rome. Soon, so a lot of these works that they're focusing on now, you will need to know, like this is one of them. Churches around Europe embraced the new style of realistic human portrayals, and Renaissance art found its way into cathedrals and chapels around Europe. Besides issuing a new era in art, the Renaissance was also a time of revival and interest in ancient Greek and Latin literature. As Muslim troops made further inroad toward Constantinople, even in the 14th century, Greek scholars began removing some important ancient Greek literature from Constantinople's collection and transferring it west. When the Greek scholars and classic Greek literature arrived, it sparked a renewed interest in the Greek language and literature. One of the most helpful contributions to the church of this newfound interest in ancient Greek literature was improved studies on the New Testament. The New Testament was originally written in Koine Greek, and the earliest manuscripts of the New Testament were also in Greek. Therefore, students of the Bible who wanted to dig into the New Testament in its original language had many more resources to help them translate and discuss the original language. Erasmus of Rotterdam, a leading humanist of the early 16th century, collected ancient Greek manuscripts of the New Testament 
and published a Greek text that became a standard Greek text for translators up to the present day. There was also a renewed interest in classical Latin literature, such as Cicero, Virgil, and Horace. So these are Greek and uh, Roman writers, and people of the Renaissance take interest in these, in these writers. Oh my god, the commercial. Oh, no. Oh, lordy. Literary experts began engaging in literary criticism, in which various sources of the same writing were compared and contrasted to figure out which source contained the correct form of the earlier writing. All of this interest in ancient Greek and Roman literature not only created a science of investigating ancient literature, but an awareness that there was a great body of ancient secular literature that was worthy of studying. For those of you guys that forgot, secular means non-religious. The church had long banned, or at least discouraged, the reading of ancient secular literature, so this revival of interest in ancient sources seemed somewhat rebellious to the church. People who believed the church had headed in the wrong direction, especially concerning the financial spending of 14th century popes in France, the subject of another video now had another set of ancient literature to consider. One of the reasons an interest in literature was able to take off during this era was the invention of the printing press. This is going to be important, but later. The, the printing press allows for books to be made much quickly. During the medieval period, people are writing books, or pe when I say people, I mean the church, because they're the only, only ones that can read or write, are writing books by hand. So it takes a long, long time. And now this printing press, this invention is created uh, where books are written or copied much faster. So more people have access to more language and more people have access to literature. So therefore, more people are able to learn, further developing these ideas of humanism and spreading them. Johannes Gutenberg invented a system of movable type in 1439, and by 1455, copies of the Gutenberg Bible began circulating around Europe. Before the invention of the printing press, copies of books were too expensive for middle or lower class readers. However, once the process of printing was mechanized, the price of books dropped considerably, and the quantity of books increased note topology, or the theological Stop issues related one. to being a human um, being. Let's move on to the next word. Oh no, Google Earth, I don't want you, bad boy. So we focused, so we did uh, Byzantine humanism, the Crusades. So what I'm going to say about the Crusades is they were a set of wars fought between uh, Christians and Muslims. Um, if I show you this map, uh, images. So if you look at this map, this is Europe. In the between 1096 and 1290, uh, 1204. So these crusades were wars fought by the Europeans. They started here, and they were the Pope, pretty much the leader of the Christian Church, said pretty much said we want this land back, this one, Jerusalem. Okay, and because we don't want the Muslims to have it, the Crusaders were able to take back the Holy Land for a little bit, and they lost it again. But the purpose of, or the importance of the Crusades is that it allowed people in Europe to see a world, people in Europe, they were able to see a world that was more advanced than them, than theirs. They brought back technology. They brought back ideas. They brought back goods to Europe, which people wanted more of, right? And another important thing about this is that um, as the Crusaders went as the Crusaders left Europe and went to the Holy Land, a lot of them ended up stopping in Italy, right? And Italy was able, the Italian merchants were able to sell these Crusaders materials, thereby leading, le leaving Italy pretty wealthy, right? So Italy is able to control the trade. There's this connection where with the gold, with the, uh, the gold rush in California, the, a lot of the people that came for gold ended up not getting rich, right? The people that got rich were the people that sold things to the gold rushers. Same thing with the Crusades, right? The Crusaders didn't get the, the Holy Land back, but their travels were able to make Italy pretty wealthy as a result of that. So there's two parts here. Um, the growth of trade and the 
exposure to a more advanced civilization that Europeans are able to now uh, uh, explore further. We have Marco Polo. The big thing about Marco Polo was the um, uh, Marco Polo map. If you look at Marco Polo's uh, travels, he went to he went to China and brought back. You know, he went to China in the twelve hundreds, so towards the end of the Middle Ages, and he brought back ideas from China again. His biggest influence on the Renaissance is that people are again are exposed to the outside. When I say people, I mean Europeans. Europeans are exposed to the world outside of Europe, which is pretty backwards at this time. It's pretty poor. There's a lot of disease. There's a lot of warfare. And Marco Polo writes a book. Uh, he's from Italy, but again, he's from Italy, right? Venice. He writes a book and he's able to, people are able to see um, that there is a better world out there leading to more trade as well. Uh, then we get to the word Renaissance. Now, this is the big one, right? Renaissance is not a person. It doesn't last five years. It lasts about 300 years. Uh, and it, it lasts a different type of time in different places. In Italy, it started in the 1300s. In Northern Europe, it started, a li it started later. But the big idea of the Renaissance is a rebirth of classical ideas, right? It is one of the greatest time periods in history because we have some of the most amazing things that come out of the Renaissance. We have Michelangelo and we have Da Vinci. Just those two are just incredible. We also have Shakespeare in England. Uh, we have Guten, uh, Gutenberg in, in Germany. Um, Michelangelo and, the, and, and, and Da Vinci are both Italian. Um, the Renaissance is a time period that starts in the approximately 1300s and ends in the 1600s. Right? And the Renaissance focuses on a lot of things, but the biggest thing that Renaissance focuses on is this concept called humanism. And we talked about humanism already. Humanism. That comes from the idea that people are important, that people can find solutions to problems through observation. And the other big one is these, these achievements in arts, sculpture, literature, Those are the ones that I'm really going to be focusing on because those are the ones that I'm really passionate about. Um, and it is centered in, the Renaissance is centered in Florence. And there's many things that make up the Renaissance. There's no one thing that makes the Renaissance. But there's a couple things that are more important than others. There is trade. Right? There is trade and there is knowledge. And these two things make like the perfect thing for the Renaissance because trade leads to money. And if you have money, uh, you can do many things with money. But one thing that people start to do with money is develop like knowledge or develop ideas, right? So we have these patrons, this patrons, you need to know that word patron. A patron is a person that pays people to do things for them. Uh, and the biggest patron of the Renaissance is going to be the Medici family. Medici family and also the Pope. The Medici family is a family of bankers in Florence. And they pay, they pay architects, engineers, sculptures to beautify this city. Because what is the easiest way for people to know you is for you to improve your city. Okay? So... Yes, we have wealth, we have a lot of money, but what do you do with that money? They could have just sat on the money and not done anything, but they did something with it. So you need both money and you need knowledge. Because you can have as much knowledge as you want, but if you have no money to do something with it, then what's the point, right? You're dead in the water. Uh, the Pope also becomes a huge patron of the Renaissance. Some of the greatest works of the Renaissance have to do with the church. When I say Pope, I mean the church. Um, 
The Last Supper by Da Vinci, The Sistine Chapel, The Ceiling of the Sistine Chapel by Michelangelo, The The Pieta by Michelangelo, The um, The Most Statue of Moses by Michelangelo, The Statue of David David Michelangelo. Now, does that mean that most of these things are religious? No. There's a lot of secular works too, like the Mona Lisa, the most famous painting in the world. So again, the Renaissance is made up of the Renaissance is is it's not just one thing, right? It's hard to define the Renaissance. It's characteristics you can say renewal, rebirth, characteristics of uh, Rome, Greece. Um, non examples you can say Middle Ages, you can say classical periods. Uh, for drawings, for the drawing, you can pick any drawing you want from the Renaissance. There's hundreds, even thousands of them. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can find something for the Renaissance here. I don't know if I have anything. Yeah, I do. Another commercial. Notion has been the centerpiece of my workflow. It's quite literally an extension of my brain. I can take notes, create... Today on The Daily Dose, the Italian Renaissance. Toward the end of the 14th century, Italian intellectuals began to declare that Italy and much of Europe had transitioned into a new age of human awareness. Gone were the brutish and unenlightened Middle Ages, replaced by a period of rebirth and growth in literature, art, culture, and science. Spanning into the 17th century, during the period, Renaissance thinkers shared a common theme book, most notably a new humanistic belief that man was at the center of his own universe. 15th century Italy was unique to Europe, with each city-state practicing its own and quite diverse forms of government. If you remember, the one city-state you need to know for sure is Florence, and that is in northern Italy. Considered the birthplace of the Italian Renaissance, Florence was an independent republic whose merchants and banking interests were third in Europe behind London and Constantinople. Wealthy Florentine businessmen gave financial support to artists and intellectuals, which will... Uh, you will need to know this building. This is called Santa Maria del Fiore, and you will need to know... We're going to get to it eventually. The, this huge dome was made during the early Renaissance. ...financial support to artists and intellectuals, which allowed their recipients to create new art and ideas without the pressing need for ordinary employment. I'll go back. Intellectual. Wealthy Florentine businessmen gave financial support to artists and intellectuals, which allowed their recipients to create new art and ideas without the pressing need for ordinary of Europe. Oh, no. They traveled around recipients to create new art and ideas without the pressing need for ordinary employment. So these artists, these sculptures, these painters, they don't need a kind of like a regular job, like a nine to four job. They have these patrons that pay them based on uh, a statue or a painting, right? So they're creating these things for their patrons. And when they're done, they get another one. They find another patron. So that's how they live. They traveled around Italy and the continent. This is uh, the Pieta by Michelangelo. He made it when he was 23, I believe. Finding new appreciation in ancient Greek and Roman texts, all the while shunning the Holy Roman Church in exchange for humanism. Many focus their energies on the laws of nature and the physical world around them, prompting artists such as Leonardo da Vinci to create detailed scientific studies on such diverse subjects as flying machines, submarines, and human anatomy. During the Renaissance, remember, they are creating new knowledge, they are investigating new ideas, and they're applying new ideas. If you look at the paintings of the Renaissance and compare them to the medieval uh, paintings, the paintings of the Renaissance, a lot of, the, a lot of them, especially Michelangelo's and Da Vinci's, they look really realistic because they had a really, really good understanding of the human body because they actually studied human bodies, right? They study the tendons, they study the, how the skin folds, they study muscles because they wanted to really be realistic as opposed to the medieval period where paintings are not realistic because that's not the purpose. The purpose is the message of religion.
Science. Scientist and mathematician Galileo studied a broad range of subjects, from gravity to astronomy, discovering that the Earth and other planets in the solar system circled the Sun rather than the Earth-centric model preached by the Catholic Church. So the Church was teaching that the Earth, the Sun goes around the Earth because it seems like it's logical, right? It looks like that's what it looks like. But Galileo found evidence to go against that. For his heresy against the teachings of Christianity, Galileo was arrested under threat of torture and death, yet he refused to recant or give in to the church's dogmatic misconceptions. When Galileo died in 1641, he was still under house arrest, not to be pardoned by the Catholic Church until 1992. Nearing the end of the 15th century, Italy was besieged by a steady procession of wars as England, France, Spain, and the Holy Roman Emperor vied for control of the wealthy peninsula. At the same time, the Catholic Church became mired in scandal and corruption, diverting public attention to its misdeeds with a long and violent crackdown on religion. We'll stop there for that one. Okay, let's move on. So that was the Renaissance. The Renaissance is a, a big one. Secular means uh, non-religious. Um, secular can mean, can be related to anything. It could be a painting, a painting of the Mona Lisa, that's secular. Uh, a song could be secular, right? Um, a building could be secular, right? As long as it has nothing to do with religion. Uh, Italy, Italy is the country where the Renaissance started. Italy is a country where the Renaissance started. Uh, so back in the 14 and 1500s, Italy was uh, not unified, right? Today, if you go to Italy, Italy is one big country, right? Includes these islands, Sardinia, Sicily, and the boot. Back in the 1500s, Italy was made up of many different city-states, and they went to war against one another. There was, there was Rome, there was Sicily, there was... Uh, um, So if you look at um, that map that I showed you and compare it to this one, so this is Rome, this is Italy back then, right? We have Venice, we have Florence, we have the Papal States in the middle, that's where the Pope controls, Kingdom of Naples. Italy is not unified until, I think it's uh, 1871, about 130 years ago, 140 years ago. That's when Italy became the country that it is today. Back in the Renaissance, Italy was made up of different independent city states. Here's Florence, by the way, in the middle. Uh, let's keep going. This video's long enough already. Uh, okay, so Florence. So Florence is the birthplace of the Renaissance, the cradle of the Renaissance. And there's a couple reasons why. Um, it becomes really, really wealthy as a result of the Medici family. The Medici family are living there. If the Medici had been somewhere else, maybe the Renaissance would have started where they had been. But because that's where they were. Florence is called the birthplace of the Renaissance, and the Medici have another nickname. They're called the um, the Godfathers of the Renaissance. Uh, Renaissance humanism, Catholic Church, Florence. It's little after the fall of ancient Rome, Europe wallowed in centuries of relative darkness. There was little learning, commerce, or travel. Then, in about 1400, here in Florence, there was a renaissance. This exciting rebirth of the cultures of ancient Greece and Rome swept from here all across Europe. In architecture, the renaissance brought a return to the balanced domes, columns, and arches of the ancient world. So you'll see that um, we're going to focus on architecture a little later. But a lot of the things that the people of the renaissance do is they copy the styles of the Greeks and the Romans. In painting, it revived realism and emotion. Artists rediscovered the wonder of nature and the human body. Portraying beautiful people in harmonious surroundings, they expressed the optimism and confidence of this new age. 
The suddenly perky Western civilization made up for lost centuries with huge gains in science, economics, and art. Florence was the center of it all, and for good reason. This is where capitalism was replacing feudalism. Being the middleman of trade between East and West, the city had money, and it knew what to do with it. Wealthy merchant and banking families, like the Medici, who ruled Florence for generations, showed their civic pride by commissioning splendid art. And Florence, recognizing and paying creative genius like no one else, unleashed an explosion of innovation. So today, if you want to become a movie star, you go to L.A. If you want to do design, you go to Paris or you go somewhere in Europe. If you want to learn how to develop supercars, you might go to Italy, you might go to Germany, right? Because that's what like Lamborghini and Ferrari are. Uh, if you want to learn, you know, become the great one of the greatest soccer players, you go to the clubs in, in Europe or you go to the clubs in Mexico where you can play for Chivas. I'm kidding. Um, if you want to become like one of the greatest mathematicians, you want to really focus on math, you go to Princeton, you go to Harvard, right? You go to MIT or Caltech. Uh, the reason I'm giving you these examples is because if you wanted to become someone, like a painter, an artist, you went to Florence. You went to Florence, you went to Rome, you went to Venice. Not so much Venice. Venice was more like textiles. You went to Florence and Rome. Those were the locations that... Uh, if you wanted to become a Renaissance painter, artist, sculptor, those are the places that you had to be in. The Renaissance was an age of humanism. It was a time of confidence when people worked hard, business was respectable, and excellence was rewarded. The church no longer put a ceiling on learning, and the great pre-Christian thinkers like Plato and Aristotle were back in vogue. In about you also need to know this one. This one's um, um, Donatello's uh, David. 1400, with the advent of the Renaissance, man, now alert, begins to stand on his own. If you look at this picture, uh, this, uh, at this statue, it looks very classical. It looks very Greek or Roman. And that was the point. Moving out of the shadow of the church. This David, by the early Renaissance Florentine sculptor Donatello, is one of the first freestanding male nudes sculpted in Europe in a thousand years. It's art for art's sake, adorning not a church, but a rich man's courtyard. While the form So it was paid by a rich person, right? It was paid by a rich person because they wanted something pretty. Uh, something religious, obviously, because this comes from the Bible. The subject is still biblical. David slaying the giant. Goliath's severed head is at David's feet. Truth be told, it's a classical nude. A celebration of the human body. A generation before, this would have been shocking. But with the Renaissance, it's art. Um, I'm going to be giving you guys a list of works that you'll need to know. Um, before, I, I mean, it'll be part of your vocabulary. Okay. So that is Florence. We talked about Italian city states already. So Italian city states grew very wealthy and they were able to fund the Renaissance. Um, I, I want you guys to really draw parallels between the Renaissance and the Middle Ages. So Middle Ages and the Renaissance, right? There are very, there's some big differences. The church is still very powerful in both of them. But here we also have humanism. Humanism, we have secularism. We have a lot of more trade here. We have a lot more money here, Right. Uh, people begin to challenge authority in the Renaissance as opposed to the medieval period. The next word is Itali uh, the Catholic Church in the medieval period. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, Greg Pocket Hole Joinery Solutions offer the fastest, Apologies. easiest way to join wood. It's as simple as drill, drive, done. With Craig Jigs, you can create DIY projects that will last. To learn more, visit craigtool.com or one of these fine retailers. So, as you watch this video, I want you to think of how is this different than the Renaissance, right? In medieval times, nearly everyone in Western Europe belonged to the Roman Catholic faith. And although not every person was a sincere believer, 
This was a time when most people held deep religious beliefs. In fact, about one out of ten medieval people became monks or nuns devoting their entire adult lives to the service of God. So again, think of religion is at the very center of people's lives. People live lives based on church teachings. And they're not going out of their way to like learn new things. Because why? Right? What's the point? As opposed to the Renaissance, people are trying to learn how the human body works. How to make a flying plane. Or how to develop a scuba dive. Or, you know, draw paintings that are realistic. Locked away behind the walls of monasteries. 800 years ago, Lords and ladies supported the church with income from manor lands and often paid the wages of priests as well. Noble families helped to maintain parish churches in the villages on their estates, in part because they believed that such acts of generosity would help them reach heaven. Wealthy nobles also paid to have beautiful funeral monuments made and to have prayers and masses said for the souls of their family members after death. Even the poor serfs were expected to give one-tenth of their crops to support their village church, even though it was a great hardship for them. And although travel was dangerous in medieval times, some people made long pilgrimages to holy shrines as acts of religious if you remember in the medieval period, trade was really not the thing because it was dangerous to travel, right? In the Renaissance, things start to change. And there's reasons why that happens, right? The plague definitely impacted people's ideas of life. People that survived were like, you know what? We can't keep living like this. We need to move. So they moved to big cities, right? One of them was Florence. Uh, so trade picks up and trade is what leads to that wealth. Ocean. But what medieval people are really the most famous for are the huge cathedrals they built all across This is going to be later in the year. Across Europe. This is not Greek or Roman. This is a uh, type of building called Gothic that the people of the Renaissance give that title. The Re people of the Renaissance call it Gothic as an insult because they see it as kind of barbaric. These cathedrals, with their soaring towers and delicate stonework, are not only great monuments to faith, they are equally great monuments to the skill of medieval architects, artists, and builders. It took hundreds of years to construct most medieval cathedrals, but when they were done, they were truly magnificent places in which to worship, places that filled people's hearts. I'm going to stop that guy there. Um, okay, next word will be Aristotle, Socrates, and Pythagoras. So these guys are Greek. These are Greek philosophers. Philo means knowledge. Um, and then, oh, sorry. Philosophia. Philo means knowledge. Uh, Sophia is, wait, Sophia is the goddess of knowledge, I believe. And Philo means love of. Yeah, Philo. So, uh, love of wisdom. Um, and they are people that the Renaissance uh, individuals study. Now, I don't want you to think that just because Aristotle, Socrates, or Plato, or Pythagoras says something doesn't mean that they were right. Right? A lot of things that, that uh, Aristotle said are actually incorrect. He said that the earth is the center of the universe, which is incorrect. And the church said, oh, yeah, that's, that, that, I, we agree with that. That is incorrect. So, again, people began to actually question these old philosophers as well. Pythagoras is the guy that developed the A square plus B square equals C square. Okay? Uh, mathematician. Um, Greek philosophers. is justice. What is the difference between right and wrong? What should we teach the young? 
These are hard questions, but they are questions the ancient Greeks thought all wise men should try to answer. The Greeks even invented a word that means lover of wisdom, philosophos, or philosopher. The pursuit of wisdom, sometimes called philosophy, is one of the lasting achievements of ancient Greek civilization. One of the most important Greek philosophers was a man who said, the unexamined life is not worth living. His name was Socrates, and you could find him arguing with people on the sidewalks of Athens during the 5th century BC. Ever since this skunk set up shop here, he's made me work twice as hard. So you say Simeus here is your enemy because he makes you work harder than you did before. Wasn't that enough to make any man your enemy? Well, an enemy is a man who does you evil, isn't he? Any fool knows that. And a friend is one who does you good. Any fool knows that too. But what a fool does not know is what is good and what is evil. Now you make better bases and you work harder because of Simeus competition. Do you not? Protagoras? This question and answer method of teaching is still known today as the Socratic method. To talk to Socrates was to be taken down the garden path at the end of which one finds that Alas, you don't know what you're talking about. So it's fun to read the works. You, you, you sympathize with the person Socrates is questioning. And you have a sense that this poor person is being had, but you don't know exactly how it's being done. Socrates is the master of this. Socrates made a lot of enemies because he questioned many of the ideas people believed in. The leaders of Athens soon grew tired of being tripped up by Socrates' sharp tongue. In 399 BC, the 69-year-old philosopher was brought to trial for corrupting the young. Socrates was offered his freedom if he would just stop questioning people. He refused. He was condemned to die by drinking poison made from the hemlock plant. But the teachings of Socrates would live on thanks to his most famous student, Plato. Plato made Socrates the main character in more than 20 of his books, including The Republic, a series of imaginary conversations between Socrates and others. Plato was born during the Golden Age of Athens. That's the Parthenon on the back. Around 428 BC, the newly completed Parthenon towered over the city, one of the crowning achievements of the world's first democracy. The first plays were performed and the first great histories written. But it was also a time of devastating human loss. For the first 23 years of Plato's life, the Peloponnesian War raged between Athens and its neighbor Sparta. Plato thought there must be a better way to live. In his... We'll stop here. Um, so Plato, Socrates, and Aristotle are the philosophers of Greece. Um, Plato was a student of Socrates and Aristotle was a student of Plato. Um, yeah. So again, going back to knowledge, right? One, going back to like understanding human nature. Uh, that one, we're almost done, guys. And then we have Pantheon, Parthenon, and Colosseum. Uh, the, I don't know if I have videos of this. So the Pantheon, the Pantheon is in Rome, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk through this, okay? I won't show you all of this. <laughs> We're standing in... So this is the Pantheon. The Pantheon was built around 117 CE. So it was built by the Romans, right? Um, it was built after the Parthenon. The Parthenon is the other one that I'm going to show you in a second. If you look at the Pantheon, you're able to see Greek influences in the, in the front. You see underneath those letters. You're able to see those columns. Those are like Greek columns. The thing that the Romans did was they added this huge dome to this building in the back. You were not able to see it right now. So I want you to understand, like, the Romans were heavily influenced by the Greeks. The piazza, the square in front of the Pantheon. This is the best preserved ancient Roman monument. And yet, look at the sense of age. Look at the weathering. Look at the way in which its history is revealed through its... So this is how you will see it from the side. In the front, you see the front where the columns are? That looks like a Greek building. But then you have this huge, massive thing behind it, the dome. You also have these round, rounded arches, right? That's very Roman. 
surface. It's been attacked. Its original bronze fittings have been ripped off. Look at the numerous holes, for instance, in the pediment that tell of all of the different purposes that this building has been put to. Originally a temple to the gods, then sanctified and made into a church. So originally it was to the gods. Now, of course, it's also a major tourist attraction. This is a building that has had just a tremendously complex history, and you can see it all over its surface. We're seeing it very differently than anyone in antiquity would have seen it. In fact, we're standing many feet higher than we would have been in the ancient world. Rome accumulated elevation from the debris of history. Once, you would have stepped up to the porch of the Pantheon. Now, we actually lie downhill. And the space in front of the Pantheon was framed by a colonnade. The colonnade and the other buildings that would have originally surrounded this building would have obscured no the barrel on the side. And so that we would have only seen this very traditional temple front. Exactly, it would have been something very familiar and the surprise was what happened as you approached the threshold. I have to tell you that I'm absolutely in love with those massive columns. They're supported by these enormous marble bases. They rise up unarticulated without any fluting and then end in these massive fragments of what were up into this vast circular space. Like the width of the building and the height of the building completely fills my field of vision and perfect enough to accommodate a perfect sphere. And as soon as you walk in, you notice that there's a kind of obsession with circles. So one of the artists that the Ninja Turtles are named after is buried in here. Uh, you might want to find out who it is. With rectangles, with squares, so this is... with those kinds of perfect geometric... So this is the Pantheon, not the Parthenon, it's the Pantheon. Now let me show you the Parthenon. The Parthenon is in Greece. And that it was dedicated to the goddess Athena. The future of work is here. WeWork gives you the flexibility your team and business need most. High atop the Acropolis in Athens, Greece, stands one of the most magnificent and most aesthetically pleasing structures in the world. So this building is in Greece, right? Uh, in Greece. It is about 500 years older than the one I just showed you, the Pantheon. The Parthenon. This 23,000 square foot... If you look at the front, you see how this one kind of looks like the other one? The other one borrowed ideas from uh, how to do it from this one? temple was constructed using 100,000 tons of radiant white marble. The exterior of the Parthenon is lined with 46 colossal columns, which strikingly appear to be laid out in the shape of an exact rectangle. And what's more astonishing is that the more than 13,000 stone blocks used to assemble the Parthenon were precisely fitted together without the use of mortar, which begs the question, how were the ancient Greeks able to build something that looks so perfect? The Parthenon is an amazingly beautiful structure. The design, the spacing of each stone is so perfect that it inspires just to look at. The proportions are so exact. For a large building, it is an amazing thing. And it lifts the spirit upward. Built beginning in 447 BC on the orders of the famed statesman and general Pericles, the Parthenon celebrates the Athenians' victory over Persian invaders who had tried to conquer the city for 50 years. Athens during the time of the building of the Parthenon is an incredible cosmopolitan, vibrant city. It's produced. The reason I'm showing you these images or this video is so that you understand that Renaissance architecture, Renaissance sculpture looks very similar to both Greek and Roman. The Greeks influenced the Romans, the Greeks and the Romans influenced the Renaissance. Using art, literature, sculpture, architecture, it's the Manhattan of the fifth century BC. And I think if you're an Athenian citizen walking, doing your everyday work, 
and then you see the Acropolis in the center of the city, this incredible than, shining hill. You're more than welcome to continue researching that one. This video is getting kind of long. The last one's going to be the Pantheon, uh, the Colosseum. The Colosseum is a, an arena that the Romans develop, and you'll see that it has both Roman but also Greek influences there. The Colosseum was, and still is, colossal. It's the great example of ancient Roman engineering. It was begun in 72 AD, during the reign of Emperor Vespasian, when the empire was nearing its peak. Using Roman pioneered concrete, brick, and their trademark round arches, Romans constructed much larger buildings than the Greeks. But it seems they still respected the fine points of Greek culture. They decorated their no-nonsense megastructure with all three Greek orders of columns, Doric, so this is a Doric. So when we say the columns, we're looking at the very top. You see how the top looks. This is a Doric one. You'll see the other ones. Doric. Ionic. Ionic. You see how there's like little swirls. And Corinthian. And Corinthian is the most, the most like plan, the one that has the most detail. Stepping in. And all those come from ancient Greece. Side, you can almost hear the roar of ancient Rome. Take a moment to imagine the place in action. Romans filled and emptied the Colosseum's 50,000 seats as quickly and efficiently as we do our super stadiums today. It's built with two theaters facing each other. That's what an amphitheater is. An amphitheater, right? Uh, and the Greeks had amphitheaters, but not just, just not this big. They had amphitheaters that were like halves, like halves, but the Romans put it together and they made a whole... So twice as many people could enjoy the entertainment. Canvas awnings were hoisted over the stadium to give protection from the... I'm going to stop here. Uh, you have a quiz on this vocabulary coming up, and the quizzes are obviously challenging. Uh, I will quiz you on whatever I went on in the video. You're more than... If I didn't include it in the video, I won't put it in, the, in there. But I might ask you, for example, what is humanism? Um, why is the fall of the Byzantine Empire important in the development of the Renaissance? Um... What is the definition of secular? How is Renaissance humanism different than uh, ideas in the medieval period? Uh, identify the Pantheon, Parthenon, Colosseum. How did Rome, how was Rome influenced by the Greeks? And stuff like that. Uh, you're more than welcome to continue developing your ideas on this, but I know that like a lot of you guys need help with this vocabulary and that's why I made this video.